do any day now. But let me ask. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order a city council regular meeting of the city of Satellite Beach, November 15, 2017, at 7 p.m. Please join Councilman Montanaro for a prayer or a moment of silence and a pledge. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here this evening to do the business of our city. Um, please watch over the families of those that have been killed um, in California um, and in the other states that we've had these tragedies that have occurred. Um, be with our armed forces, our men and women who are stationed all, all over the world and in this country. Um, Watch out over our first responders and our police and fire, and please help us to make good decisions for our community tonight. Amen. Thank you. This time we'll move on to agenda item three, which is citizens' comments. This is for non-agenda <coughs> items. So citizens' comments for non-agenda <coughs> items. The floor is open. Hearing none, back to um, the agenda. We're going to add in city attorney's report. Jim? Yes, there's uh, just one issue that uh, Courtney and I were talking about uh, earlier this week um, with respect to the fence that the that Mr. Ms. Gersh um, installed around their property and the fact that it doesn't comply with the breezeway and the as you're aware the uh, variance case ran its course through the courts and they were not allowed, they were not granted a variance to leave the fences where they were. Um, during the hearing at the variance, it was acknowledged um, that they would be required to comply with the breezeway requirement on the north-south run of the fence. Um, that obviously hasn't happened. Um, and I did speak with the Gersh's attorney and just to find out what was going on from their perspective um, but there's nothing that seems to be forthcoming as you know they there's the conversation is still more of a global kind of a thing um, with their wanting to keep the opaque fence at least on the east west runs of their fence um, so uh, I was requested in, uh, to look into uh, starting the code enforcement process again um, and discuss with Courtney the possibility if the city wanted to do it would be to go to court and get an injunction to make them have the fence comply with the code. Um, the, the concern um, expressed was, you know, the process has been going on now for however long it's been going on and this is running independently of the other case. And um, Courtney indicated that she would be in favor of the city pursuing the injunction, which would basically make them comply with the code. Um, it would be a regular lawsuit. It wouldn't be in the context of the code enforcement, because code enforcement essentially can't make them correct the fence. Basically, all it can do is impose fines. And then it's, and, you know, I don't know whether that's enough incentive for them to do anything or whether they'll file another appeal and it'll be years down the road for that as well. So the idea of seeking the injunction to make them do it was suggested to, uh, or suggested that I bring that before the council to see whether the council wanted to do that rather than go back to code enforcement. My understanding would go back to code enforcement and start this process all over. And, uh, you already got a ruling in the courts on the one issue. Correct. 
So my thing is go to the injunction rather than put this through the process again and the expense of the cost of the process. So that's my thing on the thing. Just been doing this for a long time. So that's my Jim, in your discussions with their counsel, um, did you get a feeling from the attorney exactly what? Ex how many expect to put this in the way? What result? What result do they expect from this? I mean, why are they not playing nicely with others? Where, in other words, where are we going with this? Why? Are well, the issue is, and I don't know if it's not playing nicely, so to speak, but the issue is that. You've got basically two cases that ultimately ran parallel with each other. Right. And one of them had to do with the vacation of Beach Street. And this, the, the one that I was involved in had to do with the variance that the Gershus sought to allow them to continue to keep okay. the opaque fences up. Right. And be, I'm guessing in part because they were running parallel with each other that there was there were conversations about trying to globally settle the thing. And but the ultimate place that they were, from what I gather from reading the emails, because the emails are more directed toward Cliff because he was he's handling the other case right now. Okay. That. The Gerses are looking for being allowed to keep the east-west runs the way they are, and they want some sort of a indication or something from the city as far as what they're going to allow, or what the city is going to allow them to put on the southern lot on the beach side, or the southern lots. I don't remember if there's two or three. I mean, one or two of them there. But so that's part of where it got tangled up, shall we say? Would it behoove you, rather than, and I'm not disagreeing disagree with what Frank was proposing, but would it be, in other words, pick up the phone and tell them the direction that we're going, and uh, we'd like to head that off and just fix it? And well, that's there. part of what I was going to do anyway, because okay. depending on what you were going to do, because they've already acknowledged that the north-south run needs to be fixed, so to speak. They want some indication on what that means, you know, as far as how the opaqueness is going to be measured. But um, again, the the in that like, like I said, in and from the city's perspective, the opaqueness for the north south run actually is in the charter and a variance could be granted for that anyway. Um, so the issue still is, is those east west runs and they still want they want to be able to keep the opaque fence. That's basically where we are. We have regulations correct, um, on, on this anyway. I, I, my, my concern would be why are we allowing them to keep any of it that's not consistent with the code? Oh, I, I'm, I'm not arguing. I mean, they, that was what they went to get the variance for, which was denied. Yeah, and so I'm, I agree with Frank. I think we should, you know, we've been, we've been dealing with this for a long time and we have tried to be as um, you know open and to negotiating as you know we can be with the whole thing globally and we've gotten nowhere so I would say uh, I'm fine. but my thing too is not looking at it globally forget the name on the case how would you handle this if someone else was here too you know if it wasn't the Gersh case and we are where we're with them it's got to be fair to everybody. So, you know, if this was another resident of the city, we could handle it this way. And my feeling is yes. it's not far enough. Yes. And what's going to make it comply? I and mean, that's all we're trying to do from our end is we have rules, ordinances here that need to be adhered to. And pick and choose which one we want. So that's just my feeling. Yeah. Well, I think... Even if you would go the code enforcement route, what's going to be what will be the end game, anyways? If they don't comply, you're right; they keep putting forward fines, but eventually you'll be back in court. Correct. I mean, my, to, my to enforce that. I mean, so what I'm just saying is, 
Well, we can go to court now and say, look, we would like you to comply with the current law as it is, the enforcement we have. To me, we're not, they're not doing that now. So just by going to code enforcement, all you're doing is, in my eyes, delaying the inevitable, which means you go through this whole process, we tie all that up, we assess fines, we go through that, and then in the end, we go back to court, which is what we're saying we're going to do from the beginning. So and to me, the end game is going to be the same, just the other one's going to take a lot longer to get there. And I think I kind of agree with the mayor. What we're trying to just get is compliance, regardless of who it is. We're just trying to get compliance. And that's why I don't know that it's really worth going through the whole code enforcement thing just to end up where we're going to be where we are now. Do you have an opinion on this, John, in, in one direction or another? Or? Uh, I'm in favor of the injunction. Um, you know, the, the issue with the east-west... John, 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 you need to get a mic, please. <coughs> the, uh, the issue with the east-west, because uh, there's really nothing we can discuss about the north-south, because, again, it's, it's a charter issue and, you know, it needs to apply. But with the east-west, their issue is they want this 100% opaqueness for the purposes of privacy. We have the provisions for landscaping. They can landscape the crap out of that area, and they can generate the same level of privacy as 100% opaque fence. So they can meet their needs by complying with the code. That's my opinion. It's an injunction. Do you think, I mean, I guess I'm unclear. So that for the northwest side, they're just holding off on that because they're not clear on what that's supposed to be? Is that I'm, what they're saying? I don't understand. That's, that's what I've been told, but I don't know if, what the real reason is. But okay. that's, that's what the statements I'm are. With you. I just think it's time to stop playing. I mean, what I can do is, is I'll call him, and if there's some issue about you know, I'll tell him that the, that council, assuming that that's what council decides to do, I can call him and tell him, you know, this is what I've been given my marching orders for and see if they have a different response. And if things are different, I can come back at the next council meeting and let council know what their response is. I, that, I mean, I can hold off filing the suit until after the next meeting, so to speak. But I, like I said, I'm just looking for council to vote on or... Give me, or you can give me direction. We can vote at the next meeting. However, you want to do that. So, and uh, I think, you know, again, back to what you proposed, Frank. I, I agree with it. I think that giving Jim a chance to do this about it's kind of this what part of this don't you understand type of conversation, uh, and then, yeah. But I, I think yeah, hearing you say, Jim, you'd like to have that conversation first before we go. That's where I'd like to start. Let's let's have a conversation, and then if that doesn't go, then. So my yeah, thing is because, to because the march the marching orders that for the injunction. Yeah. From yeah. there, he can come. He's our counsel. He comes back to us and said, "I've talked to the people. Here's where I think we can go for the better judgment. I'm going to listen to our attorney." Right. Well, the, so. the other issue is that the last time I talked to Cliff Rupperger was in the context of trying to figure out if there was another way to sell it. He sent me the emails that he had exchange with Cliff Shepard. Okay. So that's where it was left. So I, I want to at least be able to contact him and tell him that, the, you know, they went beyond the conversation and went back to council and council, assuming that I hear a vote or a correction, at least for this meeting, that that's where you want to go with this. I can go back to him and tell him that and see what their position is going to be on. What's your proposal? And Frank is fine. I think okay. that's a good idea. So I just consensus? Yes. Yes. Okay, then I'll, I'll do that, and then if we, if we have to proceed, then we can just have a vote on this <coughs> meeting. Right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate it. Moving on to City Council comments. Um. Well, thank you, Mayor. I, I would say that we had a uh, library board meeting last night, um, and they gave a, an overall statistic for their last fiscal year. And I have a sheet, and I'll, I'll give this to... Uh, Lenore, but I thought I'd point out a few things for Satellite Beach and the Library Beach side, which obviously, you know, we're not the size of Cocoa or Melbourne, but they had over 173,600 people visit the library from October 1st, 2016 to September 30th, 2017 for that fiscal year. That's quite a few people. Um, they had over 10,400 people attend 414 programs. That's, you know, the, the children, the teen, the adult, and community. Type thing. 
just registered at that one, they have over 18,954 residents with library cards. Now, when you think that our population is about 10,000 and Indian Harbor Beach is about 10,000, that gives you 20,000. Well, you've got 19,000 people that have library cards. Now, granted, there's also some of the surrounding areas, but that, I mean, that's almost like 100% participation for, for a small library, which I thought was, you know, extraordinary. Um, and the last one, just to talk about, they had uh, 40 people a month volunteer, over 486 volunteer yearly, and they had over 3,500 hours of uh, volunteer service down there. So, I, I mean, that's, uh, that was pretty impressive for, again, a library that's in a small community like that. Um, one of the programs I actually talked about, I think they have some kids that come over from Johnson, Johnson Junior High, is that what that is? It's over there. And they actually bring them over to the satellite library um, to spend a day over there. You know, so which really means they bypass O'Galley and Melbourne all to come over here to the Satellite Beach to do that. So I just thought it was pretty impressive statistics for our small thing. Like I said, there's some other things that talk about how many books and all that stuff there, but I just thought that was uh, very interesting. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, just to Cassie, nice job on Founders Day. It went really well. Congratulations on how it turned out to you and the rest of your team. Thank you. That's all I have. Um, yeah, again, great job. It was very well done, as always. You guys are amazing with what you guys do, with really not that many of you and what you can accomplish. I'm truly impressed. And um, just went to the League of Cities meetings. I'm sure Dominic's going to talk more on it, but it sounds like we're going to have another big fight with home rule this year. So it's really going to be really important that you guys all contact your legislatures and let them know, um, you know the importance of your local government and how we can really do so much more for you at our level than at the state level. It's, it's very important. There's a mindset that's a little scary, um, what's going on over there. So um, and that's, that's it. Thank you, Tommy. I'll echo the comments on Founders Day. It was great. There was a crowd of people at the Schechter Center that, uh, That's I true. mean, it was tough moving around over there. There were so many people. So you guys did a great job. Um, the only other thing I really want to report on is I um, had a meeting with, had breakfast with that Altman the other day, Tuesday, um, with Mark Ryan, the city manager of Indian Harbor Beach, and Kathy Meehan, the mayor of Melbourne, and Stu Glass, one of the councilmen from uh, Indy Atlantic. And we went over the Florida League of Cities priorities with that, um, also the Space Coast League of Cities priorities with that. And, um, you know, that being uh, a local government person, that is right on board with all of the issues that, that we're talking about. Um, he understands the issues with the CRAs. He believes that CRAs are great tools for city to use. And um, he's going to be supporting us in the legislature there. Um, there's a new ordinance that just, or there's a new uh, bill that was just filed that has to do with trees and the city's ability to regulate trees. And um, he understands the dynamics there, and he's not in favor of that also. Um, he understands home rule, and he's going to be supporting us there. But um, we do have our, our work cut out for us because there's already been several bills that have been filed um, that are going to attack home rule and our ability to do what's best for our residents locally. That's all I have. Great, thank you. Um, great day, Founders Day. What was that, number 60 or something? <laughs> wow. I remember the first, that's bad. Um, so I attend that Space Coast League of City also, just what Dominic said is so true. And also last night, a sustain, Sustainability Climate Ambassador Committee. They're going to be coming to us to create that as a, a board. And uh, a lot of interesting things going on there. Um, so I think next meeting it is something that is on the agenda they'd like us to do. So if you would read up on that so you get familiar with what they're doing. And that's all I have. Mayor, I want to go back. I know all this praise that we're giving Cassie and the great rec department, but I'm here to tell you I did a work day with them at Sampson's Island. And there was some serious slave driving going on out there, and she was beating us with the trees and uh, carry this and grab that and get this. So uh, although as nice as she's seen from Founders Day, I'm here to tell you, boy, she'll put you to work. And I, and I got pictures. Good. So, but, but it, was a, it was a very productive day. Uh, 
job well done out there. The place is looking much better after the, the storm out there, so it was coming along good. But yeah, it was it, it was a it was a hardworking day out there. About time it is. So. I know. <laughs> um, moving on to the city manager's reports. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'll echo what everyone else has said, which is thanking everyone who helped put the Founders Day event on, participated. It was a, a great community effort, and it, it, as you have all said, turned out very well. Um, a couple upcoming events this Friday. We have the Food Trucks and Movie on the Green. It starts at 5 o'clock. We um, partner with PAL because they do kind of the food truck side of it, and this is the uh, uh, movie Moana. And uh, I believe there will be some uh, special performances with a Hawaiian theme. And um, just as a side note, I think it's, it was it Nicole who, who did the uh, – if you go – if you look at the Facebook posting on the rec page, you'll see this. Or if you go into the, um, the actual lobby over at, at the community center, Nicole, one of Cassie's team members, actually built a, a mock of the, uh, the raft, I guess, that Moana was on in the movie. Um, I'm no expert, but it was really cool looking. So – I just want to compliment her initiative on that. So that's uh, this Friday night, and we also have Ocean Reef Beach Festival coming up Saturday, December 2nd from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's a free event at Pelican Beach Park. Um, you know, that's always a, a fun time, too. A couple of the informational items is that <clears throat> Keeper of Our Beautiful actually informed us that we are going to be, the Sustainability Board is being honored with um, what's called the 2017 Keep Brevard Beautiful Sustainability Award, and uh, the City Sustainability Board will be honored at that event, which is actually this Saturday, November 18th, from 5 to 8.30 p.m., and the details are in your, in your packet. <clears throat> also, um, Indian Harbor Beach manager, uh, City Manager Mark Ryan sent us a letter thanking, or congratulating the city for reaching the 60th birthday and wishing us the best, so that was nice. And the, uh, the last thing that's included in the packet is a, a copy of the invitation that went out for an event that um, Councilwoman Gibson has been really spearheading. Related, we call it the um, Commercial Conversations Initiative. And um, I don't want to steal your thunder. I don't know if you want to cover that real quick. Or. Um, sure. <clears throat> um, it's just kind of something that it was even through campaigning and just having lived here for a long time and it, recognizing that, you know, our small businesses are super important to our community. This is the type of community we have. We don't have a lot of industry. And um, we were trying to throw around ideas on how can we, as a city, be better with our small businesses and, and how can we create some conversations and, and work with them and figure out ways that we can help them. And we came up with this kind of happy hour idea, a little bit of, you know, elbow rubbing and, and then also – um, we've come up with ideas with some certifications that we can do for the businesses. Um, they're green certifications and um, different levels. We'll go into more detail at the, at the event. And then we're also looking to create um, welcome bags for new residents that purchase um, homes into the city of Satellite Beach. It's going to be kind of a welcome bag, and it's going to have some, some information from the city. And then we're going to allow local businesses to also put their information into this bag. Um, for, you know, hairdressers or whatever kind of business you are, whatever you want to put in there, so that when people move into our city, they know what we have to offer. Because there's a lot of businesses that are kind of hidden. You don't really know they're there. And we have a bunch of other ideas. So, anyways, it's something we've been working hard on. I'm really excited about it. We're hoping it will be an annual or quarterly thing. We're just going to see how um, successful it is. Yeah, it's, we're very excited, too. It's really our first significant outreach directly to businesses in, yeah. in a long, uh, quite a long time. So the event is Thursday, November 30th. At 6 p.m., it's going to be at the community center. So if, if you, anybody in the audience has a business, knows someone who has a business, please, you're welcome to join us. We'd, we'd love to have you there. <clears throat> and uh, that is all I had for the report. Man. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, any comments from council or additional information? Okay. There's no action items, so um, we'll move on to agenda item six. Thank you, Suzanne, very much. Uh, discuss, take action on the purchase and installation of lighting for the Satellite Beach Spark Satellite Beach Sports and Recreation Park Football Field. That's it. Thank oh, you have a new, also, you were handed yeah. a yes. new addition there. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I just want to put a quick shout out. Thank you for all the kind words, but a shout out to the Public Works Department. Danny was with us all day at Founders Day, and we would not be nearly as successful without all of their help. So. I just want to make sure that they get recognized, too. Um, okay. Moving along. Um, uh, I'm here this evening uh, requesting approval to purchase the next set of lights. 
uh, for the Sports and Recreation Park football field. Um, these would be the same type of lights that were previously purchased from Musco Lighting for the larger soccer field at the same park two years ago. Um, we use the same lights at all four of our city baseball fields. We found uh, Musco's product service and warranty to be outstanding. Um, by piggybacking off of the uh, Clay County bid, uh, staff is asking council to authorize waiving the bid process uh, to purchase the Musco lighting fixtures in the amount of $121,580. Uh, additionally, uh, staff is asking to waive the bid process to award the electrical services installation to Robinson and Robinson Electrical Contractors Incorporated in the amount of $14,674. Um, maximum project cost totals, uh, $136,254. We did receive two other electrical um, installation quotes, one from Musco uh, for $37,625 and one from Boys Electric uh, for $25,430. Um, we have 100,000 budgeted in the capital improvements plan. Um, the additional $36,254 will come from the capital assets fund um, and we should see an increase about uh, $1,240 annually for the electric itself. Okay. Thank you very much. I know this has been something from when we started the project down there. We were going to try to eventually add lights in to the system down there. I know it gets used a lot. Um, my thing is the Musco lightings are really great. And if you read everything else here, the additions, Mm -hmm. They're basically going to be free of maintenance for 20 years because mm -hmm. they're going to replace the bulbs once. Right. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's, that's a good deal. They're great lights. I think we have them now on most all of our other ballpark facilities, and they work good. Mark? Just one question, Cassie. Mm -hmm. I know we've been at this for years. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this the last lighting project that we have? I'm, I'm well, trying to think of any. Go ahead. When we first looked at that, that whole complex, right. um, we got a quote from Musco for the first soccer field, the football field, and then there's two additional soccer fields there okay. that can be lit in the future. Okay. Is, is, the, is so the demand big it's enough not, to do the other ones? What's the, that? Is the demand big enough to do the other ones down the road? I think so, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just kind of, that answers that. Yeah. Thanks, sir. On, on the ones that we're looking at down the road, mm -hmm. um, Potential for grant funding is—is is that something that we might be there's, able to look yeah, at? Yeah, there's potential there. Okay. Yep. Um, I'll make a motion to. Okay. I'll make a motion to authorize the waiver of the bid process to purchase Musco lighting okay. under the city's Clay contract, Clay County bid, um, for the sports and recreation park in the amount of $121,580 and authorize a waiver of the bid process to award the electrical services to Robinson and Robinson Electrical Contractors in the amount of $14,674 for a total expenditure of $136,254 with $100,000 coming from the capital improvement plan and $36,254 coming from the capital asset fund. Thank you. Second. Second. Second by Vice Mayor Osmer. Thank you. At this time, open up for public comment on agenda item six, which is the lighting of the ball fields. Hearing no comment, bring it back to the council. Any further council comments? Lenore? Councilman Gibson? Yes. Councilman Brimer? Yes. Vice Mayor Osmer? Yes. Councilman Montanero? Yes. Mayor Patino? Yes. Motion passes. Cassie, thank you. Thank you. When you turn lights on, people come out. That's yeah. Let there be light. Okay, moving on to agenda item seven. Open up a public hearing. It's for a discuss, take action on ordinance 1146. Jim? Ordinance number 1146, an ordinance of the city of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, amending appropriation of funds for the fiscal year 2016 2017 budget, ordinance number 1127. Said ordinance was previously amended by ordinance number 1139, providing an effective date, the second reading of ordinance number 1146. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so um, this is the second reading on the budget amendment, and um, as you have in front of you, uh, a slight change to what was presented last time. 
And just to kind of go through what that change entails, we met with the city's auditors as we do this time of year um, earlier uh, this week, and what they drew to our attention is that during the process that they go through, if they find that expenditures um, are in funds that they would rather see classified differently, so moving from one fund to another or one account to another, um, when they recommend that, if we move those dollars into a fund or into an account that does not have a sufficient budget to cover that, then it becomes an automatic, what they call a finding in the audit world, and it becomes a note in our financial statement. So what the auditors recommended we do, and you'll see it, the yellow highlighted items throughout the um, uh, exhibit, they recommended we add additional dollars for potential expenditures in items where we don't actually currently have those expenditures. So what would happen is it's not like um, there is anything coming. It would just be a sort of a, a buffer is the way they described it. So it's really just something we're doing for the auditors. That is why this has changed. The bottom line expenditures and revenues, as we discussed before, have not changed. Um, and it's really just a, a procedural audit recommendation that, that we brought that to you in, in this manner. So aside from that, nothing else has, has changed in the numbers that we originally presented to you. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Questions for this? No, I, I would just like to make a comment. I got to talk to the auditor over this. Okay. And, um, this is actually a, a, a really good deal. Um, basically, as they explained, we kind of budget to zero yeah. all the time so that everything works out. However, I could see a potential problem in the future that even though we didn't do anything wrong and that everything really balanced, but if you get that finding and it puts that note in there, I could see someone in the public get a perception saying that we did something wrong. And, um, I, you know, which wouldn't be the case. So I think this is probably a very good uh, best practice, so to speak, to do this, to keep everything looking transparent, to make sure it's on the up and up and not give anybody a false bad impression. So I, I, I agree with this. I think this is a very sound idea to go forward with. And actually, if I could add one thing, I should have mentioned, um, this apparently is something we have done in the prior years, but with our change in staff on, on the finance side, I didn't actually realize that that wasn't part of what we had done, and so we, we've all learned through this process. So it's, it's not something we haven't done in past years, apparently. Thank you. Um, at this... Can I make a motion? Okay. 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 Um, oh, let me open up for public comment real quick. Public comment on agenda item 7. Hearing none, back to council. I'd like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number 1146 on the second reading. Second. A motion by Councilman Gibson, second by Vice Mayor Osmer. Further discussion? Lenore? Councilman Grimer? Yes. Councilman Montanero? Yes. Vice Mayor Osmer? Yes. Councilman Gibson? Yes. Mayor Petit? Yes, motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to agenda number eight, which is still a public hearing. Uh, discuss, take action on Ordinance 1148. Jim? Ordinance number 1148, an ordinance of the City of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, amending Chapter 30, Land Development Regulations regarding recreational vehicles and parking by amending Section 30-107, Satellite Beach City Code, definition of recreational vehicle, amending Section 30-420, Satellite Beach City Code, parking recreational vehicles in commercial zoning districts, or zone districts, amending Section 30-536, Satellite Beach City Code regarding parking of vehicles and yards, amending Section 30-615, Satellite Beach City Code, parking or storing of recreational vehicles in residential zoned districts, providing editorial revisions, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing an effective date to the second reading of Ordinance Number 1148. Thank you. <coughs> I, um, I support this ordinance. I think this ordinance is, is going to do what the city um, and staff have interpret, interpreted it as looking at doing. And I have been vacillating back and forth on different things, and I've, I've come up with something that um, as I'm looking at the ordinance and I'm looking at the definition of recreational vehicle, Everything that was presented to us from staff and how recreational vehicles could be tied into that Friday from 1230 to Monday at 1230 really worked for me when you looked at 
recreational vehicles. The problem that I ran into when I started continuing to look at it is when I looked at the definition, we have cargo trailers or utility trailers. And to me, it's the only item in that whole definition that really isn't a recreational vehicle. And then I looked at what are the unintended consequences or what could be the unintended consequences of having that one there. And I looked at if 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday there was a boat in the driveway, you'd know it was a boat. Um, but at 6.30 in the morning on Monday when the guy who is a commercial person takes his utility trailer and leaves and he doesn't come back until Monday afternoon at 5.30 or 6.30, we're not seeing it. And what I looked at is we're giving that individual and we're giving anyone who has that type of trailer carte blanche to be in that driveway 365 days a year. And I don't think that was the intention of what the ordinance is because he's going to leave every morning with his trailer and he's going to come back after hours all the time and we're never going to see it in the normal course of business. Whereas you might see a boat, you might see a ski, any other kind of recreational vehicle that's here, but we're not going to see that utility trailer. So I looked at commercial vehicles and the definition for commercial vehicles. And to me, these cargo and utility trailers are commercial vehicles. They're either somebody's lawn service vehicle, a painting company, whatever it is, pool service. It's, it's a commercial vehicle to me. So I looked at adding some language under recreational vehicles that basically says utility or cargo trailers fall under commercial vehicles, see section 30615A. And then there's a clear definition for what a commercial vehicle is, and it clearly says it can't be parked there unless it's for a permitted use. If they're doing a renovation on a house and there's a trailer there that needs to be parked there for whatever the specific time is, and it clearly makes it easier for us to stop what's going on in our city because those are the overwhelming majority of vehicles that are violating, I think, this ordinance. And I'm, I'm looking at council to, to come up with, is what I'm asking somewhat viable? Because I, I look at it as, it's the only description in that definition that is truly not recreational. Well, let me, uh, what I'd like to do in this case is go to our building department and let him explain where the cargo comes from and if it does need to be in here or need to be taken out. Cargo trailer or utility trailer? Um, you're, you're correct, Norman. It's in both the recreational and in the commercial. And uh, it, it can be either one. I would say predominantly it is commercial. Um, there are cases that we run across where they are being used for recreational purposes, where they're, I've seen them where they, uh, they go on dive trips, scuba diving, so they've got these things set up to where, you know, they, they go out as a group and they have their tanks, all their dive gear, and they go do diving. Um, I will say that's probably the exception, it's not the norm. Um, so again, I'm agreeable to whatever council wants, but uh, I, I will tell you that it, it's in both definitions for a reason, because it can be both or neither. Let me ask one question here. Since we basically get very little complaints on this whole issue anyway, does any one of, is there any one particular, does cargo trailers get, you know, sent to you as a complaint more often than anything, any other thing, or is it just a here or there issue? No, I would say it's, it's less. Um, as you all know, I came toward the city very thoroughly. I, we did not miss anything. And uh, we went back three days later to re-verify, um, essentially treating it like a, um, a recreational vehicle where you could have it there 72 hours. Uh, the cargo trailers were not that predominant. There was, there was a handful of them out there. 
Um, and I purposely did it at the end of the day because I did want to catch those kinds of um, vehicles. Um, I, I don't remember the exact number on that list, but I can tell you it was certainly much smaller than the boats and the more common things. Yeah, a lot of these I see more, as I've said before here, as summertime type of activities. You can use outdoor recreational vehicles or happens in the summer. I think a lot of it goes away in the winter because people are not as active in their boats in the winter weather and so forth. So, I mean, I think we have provisions in here to cover it and cover the time frame too. I mean, the problem is we, not problem, but in order to, if you need full-time personnel because if they put it there Friday at 5 o'clock, the building department's closed. They come back Monday morning. And this is the way it's written. It's gone anyway. So at that period of time, you can't do anything about it anyway. So this just gives them, you know, if it is that type of a use, you know, ability to use it. I think that's why it was in both. I can tell you it's very difficult for us from an enforcement perspective to ascertain whether or not that cargo trailer, utility trailer, whichever, um, you know, we're, we're talking about an enclosed type of trailer, what is actually being used for? It could be, you know, sometimes it has signage on it like a landscape thing and it's pretty obvious what it is, you know, it's commercial. But uh, quite often there is no markings on it and we don't know what it's being used for. You know, it, it, we have to treat it like an RV, not knowing what's inside there and what the purpose of it is. It's, it's not like we would go knock on a door to ask what the purpose is. You know, if it's in violation, we're going to address it that way. Mark? Go ahead. Um, I think probably one person ought to weigh in on this because it's a definition and it's in an ordinance and that sort of thing is Mr. Beadle. I mean, I, you, you know, this is the kind of thing. What's a cargo trailer? Where does it fit? Is this problematic? Because it may, it may not be this council that deals with it in five years. It may be another council. So give us your thoughts, Jim. I mean, I don't have the commercial code in front of me right now, so I can't really address it completely. So, I mean, I have to rely on John from that standpoint, from an enforcement standpoint. And if it's problematic, I mean, obviously we can come back to council and or council can bring it up, or if the citizens have enough of a problem with it after we adopt this ordinance. I mean, that's the other thing, is see how this plays out, and if there's more problems or different problems, like you said, unintended consequences, well, if there really are any, then we can deal with those unintended consequences then. I think that's probably a better way to do it, because there's really not much we can do with this ordinance right now since it's on second reading. Um, that's part of the issue, so... And, I mean, from a sub, you can't really make substantive changes to the code that kind of go off in other directions from the way it's been written now, anyway. Okay. Well, I just I look at <clears throat> any other item that's in this definition on Tuesday. You know, it's in violation, mm -hmm. and it's going to not prone to be there until probably Friday, under most cases, because they're going to get it out on the weekend. And I agree with you. But the utility or cargo trailers, that's not the case. And I think this is part of why a lot of what's happened in the city has happened is because of this type of trailer. People saw it and thought it was okay to do these things. Um, I, I think if we turned it in as a commercial and redid the definition, we would eliminate that from happening because even, even if you're out there after hours, as you say, these things are still out there. And, and it, gives, it gives our residents that don't understand it mm -hmm. the, well, it must be okay because he's got it here seven nights a week. And that's, I think, the unintended consequence of the language that we're looking at 
is it's going to leave in the morning at 6 or 6.30, and it's not going to come back until 6 or 6.30, and it's going to be in the driveway. And that's, that's the concern that I have. And you're right. Some of them may be used recreationally. But if they're used recreationally, they're not going to go out of the driveway every day. They're only going to go out of the driveway when the people are home to use them recreationally. And most of those people that use them recreationally that way have the ability of putting it on the side of their house. Jim? If, if the issue is, and even what John's saying is, is that the predominant use of a cargo trailer is going to be for commercial purposes, I mean, we could just delete cargo trailer from the definition of a recreational vehicle because basically what John's saying is they're generally not used for that anyway because we have had code enforcement going after cargo trailers before as a com under the commercial part of the code. The and, and, I guess, and I guess the other way to look at it is if somebody's not using it as a commercial vehicle, then, they, then they're going to have to prove to the city in a code enforcement action that that's what's going on. But my, my problem there is this, that if it is, and, and I, my question always has been to the staff, this, you know, this is not a giant problem by any means. So I keep asking you, how many? And it's almost nothing. And we're making a big thing, I think, out of no, no, nothing. So in your way of a cargo trailer, if you take the definition out and a guy fits that, car, I'm just using the term cargo trailer, and it's filled with scuba tanks and that, when you show up, how are you going to handle that? Is it a cargo trailer or is it a recreational what? So, you know, well, then, then the other my way idea is to leave it here until we have well, the issue well, back. To, well, the other way to deal with it then is, say, cargo trailer not used for commercial purposes. Huh. And that way both, both, both issues are covered at that point. I'd like to know. I have several friends that are do they do like motocross and they do motorcycle, say motorcycle stuff. Trailers. And, and you would be shocked at how many of these enclosed trailers that you see are actually housing recreational vehicles. They're all-terrain vehicles. Mm -hmm. They're taking them because they don't ride them here. <laughs> they take them and put them in a trailer and they drive them to the locations that they're going to do it. And that's the use of the trailer. I have a lot of friends that do it that way. And so if you take this completely out, then you lose that ability for them to load and unload and do their recreational stuff. Because quite honestly, I don't want a motorcycle to throw in a trail. You know, so I don't want to exclude them. And I understand what you're saying, but I think if you remove this but completely out, out, that you, you really lose I, a big I would be okay if we, if we changed the language that way. Cargo because trailer, not used for commercial purposes. Yeah, I, I think it clarifies... You know what, what the intent yeah. of okay. this is. So I'm, I'm okay you with that. that. Yeah. Jim, are you okay with that language? Yeah, because you're just clarifying. Okay. You're, not, right. you're not broadening it or anything else. So. Thank you. And then I, I did have one other thing too I wanted to bring up, and I know that you know we talked about how we're going to um, use the beach caster, possibly mail a letter to residents, let them know you know what we're going to do. <laughs> But, you know, we're also in a new dynamic now where we're changing. We're going from a code enforcement board to a magistrate. And I think, you know, if you look at our police department, our fire department, and even our public works department, we have guidelines that, you know, just like in what you do, there's policies and procedures you follow. Probably you follow policies and procedures too. Um, and I'm not looking for anything, you know, Broad based. I'm looking for some, you know, specific guidelines. We had one individual in April that came to us and said, you know, he had been cited by code enforcement 20 times, and he thought he was being singled out, and he thought he was being picked on. And I think if we have some clear, concise guidelines on number one, here's how our magistrate process works. Um, here's who enforces what. If it's on the street, if it's over the sidewalk, the police department is who you call. If it's in the driveway, you call the building department. You know, some clear, concise policies on how we're going to let our residents know we're doing enforcement and this is how we're doing it. I think it's, and I'm not asking for it now, I'm asking mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if council is, is agreeable to that, um, I'd leave it to staff to come back with how they want to do it. but. I think there's, there's a breakdown in who's doing what right now because 
Um, you know, you talk about utility trailers. There's one part to block down from where your mom's house used to be on the street, right next to a ball field. It has been there for a month. It's parked on the street with a concrete block under it. Who's 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 supposed to be doing that? The the, the clear definition of the, the guidelines will say who does it, and it will let the people know that if they need to call on something, here's who you call. Mm -hmm. I, I, but we have that. No, we don't. I don't think we do. Well, I, I, I would disagree. I, um, I, I think uh, uh, Commander Varys, he, he, he'll agree with me that uh, we have a very clear understanding what is his responsibility or his department's and what is mine. And we, we talk pretty regularly uh, and we hand stuff off to him. Um, so as far as right away versus non right away, I, I think we, we got that. Um, if you're looking for something that's uh, formal and written, um, you can do that too. Um, but we, we do have a, a pretty clear understanding of what we do as a department and what the police department does. And I understand that. I think the guidelines that I'm looking for also let our residents know how we go about doing the whole process and who to call. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, you know, we can do this education stuff that we're yeah. talking about. We can do the Beachcaster, but, you know, nine months or a year from now, the Beachcaster is not there. Um, we have new residents in town. With whatever we're looking at doing in these guidelines, they're either tied to your ordinance, they're in the web, or they're on the city's web page. Um, you know, they're there and they're part of you know how we operate, so that we don't have anybody else coming back saying I've been picked on, they weren't following proper protocol, and this is our protocol. Well, that, that uh, on that you're talking about. Um, he's a frequent flyer, and we oh, have a citation I, I, process I, I, that is going to be kicking in that will take care of those okay. type of well, my, my feeling on this, on that particular, this is two different issues here. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, could you have, you know, staff and you and Courtney come up with something for it? Or and if you come back and feel that it's okay yep. the way it is, fine. If not, you can bring it back to us. Is that okay? So we can go on. Another question. After she does. I was just going to say, that's, that's maybe something we could add into this welcome packet, because if you're more concerned about people coming in, maybe when we do these welcome bags that we give to the realtors, we could maybe put just a little bit more information on the rec vehicles, and then we could mm -hmm. cover that, like any kind of major ordinance issue that we're concerned about. We could yeah, good idea. Perfect. A lot of people yep. have there we go. that. Let me open up for public comment, okay. and then we'll come back. At this time, open up for public comment on agenda item 8. Uh, thank you. David Fountain, resident of Satellite Beach. Um, the opportunity here is appreciated. Uh, if I may have just a second. Um, as you consider this ordinance, I'd like you to take a little look back uh, at the very basis of where it comes from. Um, to my mind, as I look at things, uh, look at back through the history, it looks like back in 1996, uh, the city took a major step toward um, well, certainly at that time was the approach to boats, said none. Since then, it's evolved, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, forgive me, I tried to do my research, but I see there's been an involvement of the decisions made back and then to become what it is now. Um, call them RVs, and the classification's been defined, and it's currently uh, 36 days a month. You can have them on site. But what I'd like you to, con to think about as you come to your final decisions is the purpose of the whole... Uh, section of code. And to my mind, and, and having gone through all of the code, I can't find any specific intent anywhere, not with this particular item. Nothing specified, no intent declared. But I look at it as a way of looking at the visual appearance of our residential areas, because it's concerning residential areas. And, and I know the city has significant concern over blight throughout the city, most of that's in commercial, but in my residential area, my sight lines down the street, when I came here, oh, I'm recent, I'm 2012, but when I came here, I noticed in driving through that I was looking at landscaping and driveways and houses and automobiles. And when I went through Patrick Shores, I'm looking at all those things, but I'm also seeing a whole lot of boats and trailers and things. And other communities are like that too. But in Satellite Beach, I'm not seeing those things. So my visual impression of the city is that. It doesn't have the blight. I have a, a small utility trailer. It's a simple one. It's four by eight. It's open. It sits in my side yard behind the fence so that you don't have to look at it. And as I look at the current state of affairs, and it's, you know, you're allowed 
with great difficulty to John and his department. 36 hours in a rotating uh, monthly schedule. I mean, the spreadsheet that covers it for enforcement is, is challenging. It's difficult. But, it's, but it serves the purpose of keeping that visual pleasantness in our neighborhoods. I don't know how, what kind of street you live on. I know on my street, I don't want to look out and see a trailer or a boat in every yard. I'd rather not have that. I don't have it now. And where now I have 36 days a month where I might have to look at it, you're now giving me 190 days a month where I might have to look at it. Now, I'll give you, I looked at the math from, from the agenda coming up in this. It started out as 16 days. It was called, because it's Monday, I mean, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And now you're calling it 12 because you're counting up. Apparently, if I'm doing the math right, you're looking at Monday and, and Friday as being half days. But it's still four days. And in the, on the 2018 calendar, that's 199 days where stuff can be in the front yard. And if you look at that 12-hour day of Monday and Friday, it can actually be a 15-hour day because I've got three hours to unload it and offload it and play with it in addition to my 12 hours. Just food for thought. Is it going to become a street full of stuff? Probably not because the, the basic intent of not having our yards be storage areas is still being addressed. You're limiting the amount of time that these things can be out there. But you're vastly increasing the amount of visible time in the neighborhoods. Now, the flip side of that is, and, and I like seeing this, that it's giving code enforcement an opportunity to take care of business a lot more effectively there. And it gives the residents the opportunity to enjoy some of their things. Um, I like Mr. I like very much Mr. Montanaro's call on the on the trailers. I mean, cargo utility, whatever you want to call them, they're not recreational things. They're not there to be played with. Um, I mean, those are, they're, they're, I mean you, you play with them, but they certainly don't need to sit in your front yard. Just as you make your decision, please consider that impact, um, and because we all are going to benefit from that visual thing. Thanks for the time. Dave, thank you. Uh, just real quickly, thank you very much for looking into it. Um, I, I was here. Sorry, Dave, Mr. Mayor Schechter. Uh, it was a three to two vote back then. There was a, an awful lot of discussion involved in it. Um, one of it was safety from that, you know, I don't know the exact word, the cone angle or the angle. Uh, and it, a lot of it started with very large RVs, not on the boat end to start. Then it evolved into that boat end. One of the issues we have is and John has is, and I think we've gotten better during the week on this, mm -hmm. but on the weekends anyway, we don't man that position. So from Friday we picked till Monday at noon, we said if they're there on the weekend, it's really hard for us to enforce it anyway. So hopefully it really doesn't change much other than people are going to use it, like I said before, in the summer more than the winter. And that we do, we do care about the way something looks, and uh, you know where they can. I know John has always gone up there and told them, "Hey, it needs to be back." And I, and I think most of the time you go around the streets because I've had a lot of conversation in John's office over the last six months on this. It's about this much of an issue overall, and uh, I think this will make it easier and will make it more aware. And like we said. We're going to educate them. We're going to send the information out again so people will know. And I think if we approach it that way, we'll have a better success rate. And the people who aren't, they're probably where people weren't going to do it anyway, and we have avenues for that. So. Just, and lastly, if I may close, just in, if you would allow me, that with the change and code enforcement's ability to act on things in a much better fashion than they currently can, Please go with a comprehensive plan and call it proactive enforcement again as opposed to reactive. Thank, Thank you. you. The mic is still, floor still open for public comment. Hearing none, bring it back to council. I would I mean, I'd just like to say I, I think the idea of the education is probably a good idea. I think. I Mindy mean, had a great idea of adding that. And I'll just say, if in fact, I know when I came here as a new resident, it's not like nobody handed me the, the LDR 
or anybody handed me the rules of Satellite Beach and said, this is what you can and cannot do. No one told, I didn't know when I came here I could have a boat or an RV and I didn't see anybody hand me anything that said, here, here are the rules. I could see where we could have residents that would unintentionally from the get-go do that because like I said, where did, where did you find that out when you show up and you buy your house? When you buy your house, the realtor doesn't hand you. If you have an HOA, right, you have to you know the rules because you have to sign the piece of paper that says I know and I understand all the rules that I must follow. But you don't really get that as a citizen. And I, and I agree with Dominic. You know, the beach caster is great for a, a, an initial blast, but you probably need some sort of a, a follow up to go along with that, just to make it clear and make it understood, and I think you're right, new residents probably should be given some sort of, here's the general stuff for you know, because like I said, I know when I got here, no one told me what those rules were. Um, one thing to, that's a question that just came up, reactive, proactive. We are proactive and we are reactive. Because we don't fund the position that the, a gentleman's going to drive around the X number of miles of streets every day trying to find that particular ordinance being broken, that's not how we're proactive. If they see it, they react to it. And then again, if they're called, they react to it. So just, I know that's been brought up a lot, and I just wanted to make sure that's clear because John and I have worn out each other. Mark? I'll make a motion to pass uh, ordinance number 1148 on second reading with the definition change as outlined by Attorney Beadle. Second. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion by Councilman Brimer, second by Councilman Gibson. Before I go any further, Councilman Gibson, you had something you wanted to say before before I opened it up for public? Um, you okay? Lost now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Any further comments? I'm having a problem understanding why there's still trailers parked on our streets. Give uh, either me or Bert that address um, because uh, I, I know the last time we spoke about it, uh, I assumed that was resolved. And I don't know if it came back or what the issue is, but um, again, it's in the right away. PD will deal with it. They've been very responsive. As I have it, has been on the property. Okay. So. On the t one second, let me just bring it back here. That has to do with enforcement, which is not what we're voting on right now. So I'd like to stick to this. I, and I then with if you saying. have that issue, I know you can take it up with John mm -hmm. and that. But the task at hand here is agenda item. And I, and okay. I realize that. But I also realize, too, that we're being told that stuff is being enforced. And, and I'm telling you that it's not. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned because um, we walked down Orange Street in the parade and there was a trailer that was hanging out over the sidewalk um, that had been there for several weeks. And these things, if, if, we're going to, if we're going to say that this is what we're doing, we need to be doing it. Okay, great. I'm going to call the vote, please. Councilman Montanero. Yes. Vice Mayor Osborne? Yes. Councilman Gibson? Yes. Councilman Primer? Yes. Mr. Yes, motion passes. Thank you. John, thank you very much for your hard work on this particular item. Thank you for the public comments. Still open for a public hearing. Moving on to agenda item nine. Discuss, take action on Ordinance 1149. Jim? Ordinance number 1149, an ordinance of the City of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida. Amending Chapter 30, Land Development Regulations, Satellite Beach City Code, by amending Section 30-107 to provide new definitions related to medical marijuana. Amending Section 30-416B, see Commercial Zoning District, to allow medical marijuana treatment center dispensing facilities as a permitted use. Creating a new Section 30-622 to provide regulations for permitting medical marijuana treatment center and medical marijuana treatment center dispensing facilities within the boundaries of the city and providing disclaimer waiver and indemnity provisions, providing legislative findings, repealing ordinance number 1136, providing for severability, providing for conflicts clause and providing an effective date, the second reading of ordinance number 1149. And I would like to bring up one point. There was an inquiry made regarding the language about the schools 
and how they're stated is public or private elementary school, middle school, or, element, or secondary school, that language is taken straight out of the statute. Thank you. Motion to approve 1149 on second reading. Second. Uh, a motion by Vice, excuse me, Councilman Breimer, second by Vice Mayor Osmer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, I know that we're, and I'm trying to make sure that we are strictly covering our, our basis here. Um, we're saying medical marijuana, medical marijuana, medical marijuana. Should we have anything in here, because I've, I've been doing some reading on this, should we have anything in this that specifically says we will not allow recreational? So that if the legislature does something to amend how medical marijuana dispensaries are able to dispense marijuana, that we have something specifically in our ordinance that says recreational marijuana is not allowed. Uh, well, my feeling is that 72% of the people voted for this particular thing as a constitution. I, I'm in favor so of what, this. What I'm saying is if someone comes back and they voted again and they voted, I'm not saying they will or they will not, if they vote in, the majority of the people, if they voted in for recreational marijuana and it passes, we are, the way our government is set up is by the will of the people. They, which is something I, in fact, I had a conversation with George on this, is the other cities ban and moratorium it. Well, people voted on it, 72%. So what is the will of the people? So if the will of the people comes back and says 72% of them wants it recreational, you're going to say it no to them? No, I'm going to say we come back and revisit the ordinance and we say it's okay. Well, but I don't want the state telling us that we have to do it. We can do it locally because I'm in favor of whatever the, the, our residents want to do, but I would have no problem coming back and revisit this ordinance because I know 72% of our residents voted for this, and I wouldn't have any problem coming back to revisit this ordinance and approve it that way, but I don't want the state telling us that we have to do it when clearly what we approved was medical marijuana the first time well, around. My thing is we approve this ordinance as medical marijuana, and if that issue comes up, then we tackle if it. They because they preempt us, be we can. Well, so if it's in there now, Jim, do we have it in there and it's in there so the state can't preempt us? Because, frankly, I'm tired with the state preempting everything we do. So that's why I'm asking, should we cover our bases now and put it in there specifically, and if it passes and we want to come back and revisit it, we can change it. But the state's not making that decision for us. Okay. There's, there's, there are two different issues. Um, one is the state has preempted this whole field. I know. And my point is, is they can do that with recreational marijuana as well. I, so you're... It's our ordinance... I don't know, but that's what I, I have no idea, because I don't know how the legislature, I mean, I'd be looking at a crystal ball, so to speak, for that, because what the legislature, you know, tosses us, you know, to keep us in line, so to speak, um, you know, I can't, I, I, there's no way I can divine that. I mean, there's just no way. Um, and if you now... There have been occasions, it's the best way to put it, there have been occasions that the legislature has allowed pre-existing grandfather provisions to remain intact. Vacation what, what? I'm sorry? Vacation rentals. Yes. Prime example. Correct. We had it in. No, I know. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And the, but the issue becomes that is outside the scope of this ordinance. And... What I'd be concerned about is that that prohibition could be attacked even if they allow us to do it because it's in the context of this ordinance. If the, if the council wants to do that, I think maybe we should have a separate ordinance that only deals with that okay. and sets up the prohibition. But the problem is we have to do it before the end of the year is what I'm trying to remember how this works. But I'm just saying if you're going to do it, that's probably the better way to do it because I don't know that it's going to work in the context of this ordinance. I would be okay with that. All right. 
Further comments? And I was just going to say that. I mean, I think we did that for this in the beginning when we knew it was going to go on the ballot. I think at that time we went ahead and, and made the proposal that we weren't going to allow it from the get-go until the, and then the ballot happened and so on. So I think in that case we could do it as a separate. If we hear that that is going to be on the ballot, we could then go in there and, and make a proposal that we were going to whatever ban it until we see what happens and then go from there. Yeah, we didn't do it. I, I would I would only add one thing to that is. The other problem with the way the legislature does these kinds of things is they say that if you have it effective as of X date, which right. a lot of times is actually before they adopt their legislation, and that's right. the concern. So in that context, if you want to do it, I would agree with Dominic that you probably should do it sooner than later. Right. I agree with that as a separate item. But the, you know, the reason we did it, was because we didn't, uh, my understanding was we didn't know what the state was going to do. Right. So therefore, right. once it passed, we did it right. to make sure that we were covered t because we have eight, uh, they had eight or nine months before they right. had to come out with it. So we wanted to cover ourselves during that period. Okay. Um, at this time, open up for public comment on agenda item nine. Hearing none, back to council, further council comments? Um, would Jim, would we have to, if we were going to look at something like that, we'd have to do it before the end of the year? I don't know. I can find that out. I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned. I just can't remember. Okay. With all the stuff that came out of the I'm, state I'm, this year, I can't remember which ones we had to do before the end of the year. Before. Okay. I'm in favor of this, and I'm also in favor of having Jim look at if there's something that we can do to just make sure that we have that base covered. I would, I would be comfortable doing that. Okay. Okay, um, any further comment on agenda item nine? Lenore? Councilman Gibson? Yes. Councilman Montanero? Yes. Vice Mayor Alton? Yes. Councilman Driver? Yes. Mayor Catino? Yes, motion passes. Moving on to um, agenda item 10, if you'd please look over this for the December 6th council meeting. Um, and I'm sure there will be um, additions. Also, if we want to change boards that we sit on, the liaisons to those boards, the next meeting is when we do that. Okay? Thank you. Yep. I'm not going to be here at the next meeting. I would like to stay on as the uh, pension on the pension board. I'll make a note of that and see if somebody else, if no one else wants to, no problem at all. Okay. I don't see a problem with that. We don't have any indication yet as to whether we're having a second meeting or not. Do we? Well, right. we got to have the first one. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the, the next one will be on the 20th. Uh, the, yes, it would be. So, let's. I'll I'll just throw it out. Yeah. That's, that's we, fine. We've that's already fine. discussed it, and that's why okay. we're going to have the six. That's all on here. Okay. Good. Yeah. okay. Moving on to agenda item 11, adoption of the minutes. Is that about a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, approve the minutes. The City Council Workshop meeting, November 1st, 2017, and the City Council Regular meeting, November 1st, 2017, as submitted. Okay. I have a motion by second, and then I have a motion by Vice Mayor Osmer, second by Councilman Gibson. Further discussion? Chairman Lenore? Councilman Brimer? Yes. Councilman Montanaro? Yes. Councilman Gibson? Yes. Vice Mayor Osmer? Yes. Mayor Patino? Yes. Motion passes. Any further business? Before council, hearing none, meetings adjourned. Think what you can do with your backyards. <laughs> Fill that pool.